Hi, and welcome to Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, have we got a show for you today. There are going to be fireworks, I'm sure, before the hour is up. Uh, actress Sharon Farrell, uh, who has also uh, now added the name uh, author as well as actress to uh, her resume, uh, has bared her soul in a uh, gut-wrenching memoir. Uh, Sharon Farrell, Hollywood princess from Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, Sharon is uh, going to join us here for the hour on Studio 411 from California. Sharon, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you very, very much for having me. Absol what fun. Absolutely. Now, tell me, what? Uh, uh, not what was the idea. Obviously, it's based on your, your life up to, up to the last year or so. But uh, what was the motivation or who gave you the idea to, to uh, put a book out uh, talking about your uh, illustrious career? Well, I've been, I've gone through so many crazy things in my life. I mean, my heart stopped for four and a half minutes and I had to overcome that. Um, I, 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 I've been left on the bottom of a jet ski that was capsized in, in the ocean and friends that swam away and left me alone to die. And I just like overcome just about everything. And I, I really shouldn't even be around. I really shouldn't be around. I, I watched friends die and... Uh, I don't know. I'm still here, so I guess I'm. God's not finished with me. So, I I started writing the book because I just had. I was kind of mad. I was angry because I had. I, I had just made so many bad choices in my life, and I was. Uh, I think I was in a nut house at the time, uh, and I, it was like kind of an accidental thing because I had like collapsed outside of a of a Simi Valley Hospital. Uh, you, at UCLA, and I had collapsed because I hadn't eaten anything, and my I was kind of running out of gas, and I was just going to sleep in the car. And this cop came, and he took me into the hospital, and all of a sudden, I was like in this nut house, and I got so angry because um, um, the way they treated me, I, I'll, it was just it was just horrendous. And um, the next day. A social worker came in and she says, Sharon Farrell, what are you doing in here? And I explained to her how I had collapsed, the, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And she said, well, listen, you're just following my lead. We're getting you out of here. I mean, it was like really scary. And it's like um, they had, I had, I had told them because I had gotten back from New Zealand and I had scabies, which are like little critters that crawl under your skin. Mm -hmm. And I said, I came here because I, I've got scabies and I want to get rid of them. And they didn't really know what they were, but they stuck me in this isolation room and they, they took all my clothes away. And there was a great big, huge window and they were looking in on me and I, I could see them and there was a bright light all night and I had no blanket. I had no covering. I had no clothes. And it was like the most humiliating experience I'd ever had. I mm -hmm. swear to God, it's, it's like at night, if you go to the hospital, the nurses and doctors at the hospital at night are like different kind of people. I mean, <laughs> Halloween is coming up. And, I, you know, I, I'll, I swear to God, they're just not, they're, the, they're not the same as daytime people. I'm making, I'm making a note now, nasty letters from physicians and nurses. <laughs> so, so we've started there. All right. Anyway, let Oh, let, let, all, we'll go. All. We'll go back a few a few years before that. Now, tell us about uh, uh, back in the day uh, where you were born, Sioux City, Iowa. Tell us here in the the Northeast. Give us a little thumbnail of what life was like growing up in Sioux City, Iowa. I know Ottumwa, Iowa. That's radar. But you're about the only other oh. you're about only the only other person I know that's from Iowa. So tell me, you know what what life was like, and then how you got to be you know, New York to Hollywood, how that all came about. Well, um, I was in Sioux City, Iowa, and I was studying ballet with my ballet teacher. And my ballet teacher was taking me to Denver, and she was taking me to, uh, she was taking me to the American Ballet Theater Company because she was affiliated with that. And I, I was going to Denver, and I got into a play, and um, and then the poet laureate of Denver saw me, and he put me in a play in Central City, and then they cut my, my dancing, they cut all my dancing, and they added words to my my performance, they add a dialogue, and all of a sudden I was an actress, and I was making more money than being a dancer, so 
I started being an actress. So yeah, dancing uh, is tough, you know, especially whether ballet or whatever. It's hard because the oh, lifespan is a lot less than uh, you know than being an actor or an actress. You don't ever you don't get paid. The, the, they don't get paid. You don't get paid anything, and yeah. you're never you're never good enough. You know, you always have to have a, a higher extension, a bigger turnout. Oh, it's dancers are just unsung heroes. They don't, you know, it's like if they're if you're in a production somewhere and if there's like candy wrappers on the floor, they blame the dancers first. And then the thing it's like echelons, you know, it's like dancers at the bottom and then you have singers at but the actors are the ones that get paid the most and have the most respect and you know, I went from, hey, Sharon, get over here to Miss Farrell. What, you know, where would you like your chair? You know, it's, wow. it's, it's terrible, but that's the way it is. I didn't know I was supposed to call her Miss Farrell when we were setting up for the show, but see, now I know. Miss Farrell, by the way, her book, Sharon Farrell, Hollywood Princess from Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, again, for more information uh, and to uh, uh, reach out uh, with Sharon, uh, www.sharonfarrell.com. Dot com. So now you wound up then in the uh, late, there's the book right there. Uh, and we also have a shot of it there uh, in our in our production booth as well. Now, for folks who might not know Sharon, again, from the 60s through the uh, late 1990s, actually starting in 1959, I mean, quite an impressive list of uh, credits. Again, we're going to talk about a few, but I would need almost like two or three hours just to cover all these. Uh, TV shows, Death Valley Days, Gunsmoke, Fugitive, Ben Casey, Hawaii Five-0, of which she was a regular for uh, a season and a half. Uh, she was in the long-running soap, The uh, Young and the Restless, for uh, several years. Um, movies, uh, The Reavers, uh, Marlowe, uh, It's Alive, The Stuntman, Out of the Blue, uh, just, you know, on and on and on. But we'll go back in time. Tell me, how did you wind up in... Uh, probably, what, late 58, early 59, how did you wind up on the, uh, the set of your first movie? Uh, and uh, tell me about that, uh, that experience in Havana. Oh, boy. Um, well, I, the, day that I, the day that I got, the day that I got that movie, I, didn't have, I was totally out of money, and I was trying to borrow um, uh, a coin for the subway from my girlfriend. And we used to get the subway, these, these folk, they were just slugs. And they were like, you could, you could buy for $5, you could get like 100 of them, you know, I mean, thousands of them, practically. And they were like, it was against the law, it was a criminal act to use them, but I mean, all the actors used them in New York. I mean, everybody, every, anybody who, could, who knew about them used them because, you know, every, times are tough and things are expensive and I don't know, I used to follow the crowd, you know, it's, so anyway, I, I was out of these slugs, you know, you use them for washing machines too, but I was out of slugs and she wouldn't give me one of hers. And so I had to walk from like 73rd street and Riverside drive all the way down to like CBS. And the casting director at CBS was casting, uh, this movie called kiss her goodbye. And Elaine stretch and Steve Hill were like the big stars in it. And, um, uh, uh, Steve Hill had um, a mentally retarded sister, which was me, and uh, she attracts men wherever she goes because she'll go to a playground and she'll swing on the swings and her dress will come down, her panties will show, and she was like that. So um, I got the I I went in there and and I got it and uh, I got the part and um, uh, my dad flew in from Sioux City, Iowa to sign papers because I was too young, you know, I was too young to like do, to go by myself. Right. But so he came in and he signed all the papers and everything and it was the old RKO Studios was the name of the studio that was doing the movie. And so we flew to Cuba, Havana, Cuba, and it was right after the, I mean, they were still doing body counts and body, you know, I mean, they were... We were staying at the Havana Hilton Hotel, and, and our production company was all on the eighth floor. On the eighth floor, and <clears throat> Fidel on the sixth, the sixth or fifth floor, or yeah, because he was on a lower floor than ours for some reason. I think it's because there was a balcony outside, and he could talk to people at night. Fidel, Fidel Castro, places. just for those those tuning in who are not sure what we're talking. Fidel Castro, the up and coming. Uh, 
uh, what would we call a re revolutionary dictator of uh, then Cuba. So continue. So um, I one of the one at one point um, there was a gal. Her name was uh, Eleanor Stetson, and her she had a she had a, a husband who was. I think he took care of the lights and stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. He did. He did. He was production, and um, she she would get she would exchange our money for Cuban money so we would have more money, and um, uh, so uh, she knew Fidel and she knew Che, but um, I I was doing this scene with Stephen Hill. And he, he comes into this restaurant and I'm I'm dancing around and men are looking at me and and he gets mad and he slaps me. Well, he slapped me so hard he knocked me out, and it's like I got I got done with a show, and um, I got done with the show that ta the show that day, and I went back to my room and I fell asleep, and I woke up, and there was supposed to be a big party, and I I went downstairs, I was running downstairs, I was running to the elevator and going down because I wanted to go to this big party that all the cast and the crew were all involved in, and they had left, they had left without me, and there was this one Cuban girl that came up, she says, oh. She says, why did he hit you like that? And I said, well, he, I don't know, you know, he just did, you know, he got carried away. I don't know. I didn't know anything anyway. It wasn't very professional of him, but, you know, Stephen Hill was like, he was like a really good actor. And he, but he was, uh, he was, um, you know, method. So I don't know. He, he really hit me too hard. Wow. So she says, well, I don't, she says, I think it was mean. I don't care. You know, method, method, you know. That was mean of him. I'm going to take you up to a real party, but you got you can't tell anybody because we're not supposed to go up there. So I said fine. So we go upstairs, and it's it's Fidel Castro's having a party. So we go we go in there, and Fidel like says, "Oh, pobrecito animalito de Dios," and he's like he like you know I was blonde and I was like curvy and all this kind of stuff, and. He said, he welcomed me and he threw a, he he threw a watch at me. He's probably off of some dead person that they killed that morning. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, I'm gonna have, you know, any you can have your choice of any man in this room, and he will guard and protect you while you're shooting this movie. So all of a sudden there was a guy and he was standing like with his hands on his hips, and. and and he was just grinning at me. And he looked kind of like my dad, actually. He had a widow's peak, and he was, I thought he was, I thought he was sexy and cute. And he had really, he was really dirty. He had dirt, he was just really dirty. And my dad was like a mechanic, so it was like I was used to that. So, um, and it was Jay Quivera. And we went off on a motorcycle, and then things happened, which I write about in my book. I'm not going to tell you here. Yes. I'm not going to say what we happened. Want, we want to leave a cliffhanger for the, 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 the reader. We there you go. Ran off and we got back, and, there, and, and he was coming up to my room, and uh, there was a bomb that exploded right then, and he had to run off. So he ran off, and I got up, you know, I, some, another bandito took me up to my room, Wow. And um, now you told me uh, when we were uh, working to set that this up that of my affair with Jake Rivera. Yeah, and he he used to send you like plane ticket to try to you know come visit him before, of course, before yes, the uh, embargo. Yes, he wanted me to go to Bolivia with him. Yeah, and I wanted to go. And my roommate, she was from Puerto Rico, and she said, Sharon, this man is married. Do you think you're the only one? He is a uh, you know, he just runs around. He is seven years younger than your own father. You know, you are not going to let you do this. You know, I will. What about your career? No, 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 no. And then I'd, I'd come home and I'd, I'd hear her on the phone. Well, she's not here. She moved out. You know, she's talking on the phone to somebody. And it was, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was him because there was, and they were good because I would, I would. It was, she was speaking in Spanish. Right. And and it's like I couldn't hardly. I, Shay and I could hardly even communicate with each other. We were like, I mean, I had high school Spanish, and then he was, you know, he was coughing and smoking cigars and coughing up blood, and oh, my God. Anyway, so, but we were speaking in another language, actually, sure. other than that, that kind of language. As the, as the song says, the language of love. There you go. Yeah, you, yeah, you. <laughs> You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. So, author, he was the very first man in my entire life. Yes, yes, my I'll say. First, 
man. So when, I, when you see like the t-shirts and different memorabilia that, that show, uh, you know, the great Che Guevara, uh, who of course passed away, I believe around 1969, and, and one of those. And cut uh, his hands and his head wow. and everything and held and put him on poles. Wow, that could be a little bit of a handicap, let me tell you. But anyway, oh, yeah. but do you ever see like images of him like on a t-shirt or something and think back, oh, oh yeah. my goodness, there's, there's my Che. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, that with Bruce Lee and I do that with Steve McQueen. Yeah. I, I've had some really great for I've had some those are the three loves of my life. Yeah. Well see she just stole my thunder. I was just gonna say the book is uh, Sharon Farrell, Hollywood Princess from Sioux City, Iowa. And of course uh, amongst the uh, uh, stories of Hollywood and, and parts unknown, Sioux City as well. Uh, she profiles her love affairs with some of the greatest known men, including the aforementioned Che Guevara. Bruce Lee and Steve McQueen. So now we've ruled that out. Uh, very impressive, by the way. I, I've told people as we were getting ready to setting up to do this program, and I said, well, you know, that's pretty good. You know, three boyfriends, those are pretty top three in some people's minds. A revolutionary, a martial arts icon, and a probably the, one of the first true action heroes of modern, you know, modern Hollywood. So, you know, very, uh, very good. Very good. So, uh, but overall, we discussed off air, your choice in men sometimes leaves something to be desired other than perhaps those three. Would we agree to that? I'm not very good at choosing men. There the ones go. that were married that I chose were like really good, but yeah. I, I always thought I was just the only other woman and I, now I know that I was probably one of very, of a whole lot of them. Yeah. I, I, I'm not very good at it. No. I'm not good at picking men at all. Now, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, you met him, uh, I assume it was what, post Green Hornet? You met him on the movie Marlowe? Well, I, I met him on, I met him on Marlowe, uh, James, James Garner. James Garner movie, yeah. And um, I was playing the little sister in Raymond Chandler's novel, The Little Sister. And it was a remake, I think, I don't know whether it was Robert Mitchum had done it before, or Humphrey Bogart had played the James Gardner role. And I don't, I don't even, rem I don't, I don't remember who. Yeah, I think we, we, I there played she is. my sister, she was like the movie star that I was like blackmailing. Sure. I was terrible. I, I, I was really skinny and scrawny in that. And I, that's where I met Bruce. And, um, he, gosh, I just, it's so weird because the first time I saw him, he came out and put his hands on his hips and did a flip. Something about men putting hands on hips really is a is a turn on for you. I'm getting that impression. I, something's wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness George Reeves wasn't alive then, because you know he used to do that when he did Superman, you know, or or uh, Adam West. Did you know Adam? <laughs> I, I, didn't know. I never knew either one of those. Oh my Maybe goodness. Thank God. <laughs> um, now, oh, I, I digress for a minute because otherwise I'm going to forget about it. Um, I saw a photo. We don't have it, unfortunately, but uh, last couple of years you uh, you ran into one of your old bows, I think, or old friends, certainly Ryan oh, O'Neill. Ryan O'Neill? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Did I guess right? Yeah. yeah. What was uh, that? Yeah. Uh, did you date him at all or no? Yes, I did. Yeah. And you know something? He was he he was a guy that I should have been. I you know he was available and everything else, and he wasn't married. And I should have really gone out with him more. But he used to drag his little brother around with him all the time, and he used to wear these plaid jackets. And I just thought he was like some kind of a geek, you know. And he, I mean, he was adorable. And he was nice and all that kind of stuff. But. And then love story comes out, and you're like, I could have had this guy. I, you know, and I ran into, you know, I, I've just always adored him, but I never, I don't know, it, it was like, um, I, I, I don't know, he scared me somehow. I mean, I, I was with him. I mean, we, we, we met on a TV show. Yeah. And, um, and Terry Moore, you remember that? The, the, yeah. Her, she's still alive. Mighty, Mighty she's Joe her, Young, yeah. She's written a bunch of books that are wonderful. And she, and, uh, she um, posed, didn't she pose for Playboy in the 80s? Oh, she's done everything. Yeah, because she, she was married to uh, Howard Hughes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's this, and she's she's bright and smart and really fun. I went with her with a group of people to the Academy Awards about 
six years ago, I yeah. guess. She's she's a wild woman. Yeah. She's like she's a lot of fun. Yeah, Terry yeah. Moore is a lot of fun, and um, um, but you know, a lot of the people that I know, they're not they're not they don't they don't want to work or they're not working, and I I've been trying I I I've been thinking though well, maybe I have to go back to work. You know, maybe I have to. I would like not to, but. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to have what I, I, I have a house and property that I paid for and I did all of this stuff, but I might have to split it with sure. somebody yeah, else, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. So if I do that, then I'm going to have to go back to work. So I've been talking to, there's a gal named uh, Barbara Bach, B-A-K-K-E, and uh, my old agent Sharon DeBoard, who was also in the Reavers with me with Steve McQueen. I, I saw her name, and I used to have the biggest crush on her when I was I, in school because she played Nurse. Uh, was it Nurse yeah, Sharon? She was, uh, but she was on General Hospital. She was right? on General Hospital. She was married on the show to this kind of creepy guy named Howie. I don't know. You know, she'll know. But I didn't know she became a uh, an agent. She became an agent, and I, you know, she she was kind of, I mean, she was a really wonderful agent, and she got to be really friendly with this really adorable casting director on The Young and the Restless at the time, and she had me in, and um, Ed Scott was married to uh, Melody Thomas Scott. Yes, yeah. And Melody Thomas Scott had seen me in a, in a show I did, A Name of the Game, where I played a Janice Joplin type yeah, uh, yeah. singer, rock and roll singer. And she always liked my work. And she they they really just got me on the show. And um, But Sharon DeBoard, she, that girl, I mean, we even dated the same men. And I didn't know it. She did. But I didn't know it. And she finally confessed to me. And I thought, oh, my God. Sharon, if I had known, you know, I would have backed off. You know I mean? It's like you've heard of that. Was it six? horrible what, when I was what's young. That, I was, what's I that was, game they do where? Anybody else except myself. I was totally shallow and, you know. Oh, well. I guess I'm, I guess I'm, getting, I'm getting my comeuppance we, now. We, we try to learn from our mistakes as you and I were speaking earlier. Oh, yeah. I don't know. When is it going to stop? You no. know, it's like, good heaven, I learned enough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm worn out from learning. <laughs> Author and actress Sharon Farrell joining us here uh, for the hour on Studio 411. Uh, Sharon Farrell, Hollywood princess from Sioux City, Iowa. Um, quick question, short answer. Uh, uh, top three male actors that you uh, have had the privilege to act with? Oh, um, Peter O'Toole, Steve McQueen, Patrick Dempsey. Oh, golly. James Garner. There you go. There's three. I loved all of them. Oh, oh, how God. about how about females? Because I know sometimes actresses don't. You oh, know, they. I worked with Eve Arden. I worked with. Uh, where was Eve that? Arden Rush is wonderful. Where, um, where did you work with Eve Arden? Eve Arden played my mom on uh, Man from Uncle. I did about three or four of those Man from Uncles. I know I the did, I, I know the first the one. Oh, I did matter, all those shows. So. Matter of fact, I, I think we great moms and dads, and I mean, half the time I didn't even know I was working with, and they were like famous, famous, famous people, sure. you know that, you know, went back to silent films like French O'Tone. I worked with him on a Hitchcock. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we even have a shot if the crew in there can pull it up at some point. We've got a couple of shots of uh, Sharon back in her Man from Uncle days. We've got her at a beach scene and. Uh, and we've got uh, we've got her on something else. I think with uh, Robert Vaughn and David McCallum. Now, see, there would be a great show. Uh, if uh, what's that NCIS with David McCallum? That'd be great. Uh, I listen. I uh, he, uh, he contacted me, and I thought I thought, oh my God, I want to do that show. And he just wanted to have lunch. And that guy's still a rooster. Yeah. I'll tell you. Oh yeah. He was uh, what? Well, he was married years ago oh, to. I mean, he didn't know. He says, "I don't know anything about casting directors. You know, I've got a room over here. You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, he's a madman. You know, yeah. he's, you know, you should. I'll, I'll tell you, men are men are men are men. Oh. That's just the way they are. I don't care what <laughs> everybody's saying these days about Bill Cosby and Donald Trump and all the others. Men are men, and usually they'll rape us if they get a chance. <laughs> My goodness." Strong words from Sharon. All right. And, well, it's, it's true. I'm yeah. just kind of, I don't know. You just don't go to the Playboy Mansion. You just, you know what? You have to be home in bed by 830. Yeah. And that's the only way you can really stay out of trouble. 
There you go. You have, to, you have to you have to just be a daytime person and not be a nighttime person because people get a couple drinks in themselves or something else and you know they're not they're not who they are. There you go. They're just not who they are. Quickly changing the subject. See the bell went off. Now we can move on to something else. Behind you, show us uh, uh, just point in the direction. You've got uh, a painting of yours. Again, uh, folks can. Uh, uh, yeah. go to, uh, can you, see can you see it? yeah, oh no, we got it. No, 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 don't move the camera. We're good. That premonition is the movie yeah. I did. That's but, just like, a, I just, I just tacked that up at the wall just so yeah. I got this from a, a Facebook fan. Yeah. Yesterday. And go. I got, I got another, I got another book. I got another book too. There you go. Well, got another book from this gal. There you go. You, oh, Joy Lansing. Yeah, I remember she was on Superman and many, many programs. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I never knew who she was. Yeah. But the guy who wrote it. Uh, she was kind of a poor, uh, poor woman's uh, Jane Mansfield, but she's very, very talented. But again, it was you know in those days it was, uh, it was a lot of a lot of competition. That was a little before your time. But anyway, getting back to the bear back there, uh, Sharon. In addition to all her other exploits is also a painter and uh, SharonFarrell.com for more information even on the paintings. I think there's photos of all uh, many of the uh, the photos that she's done. And Sharon Farrell, actress and author joining us here on Studio 411 for the hour, the uh, uh, memoir that uh, Sharon has uh, written. Sharon Farrell, Hollywood princess from Sioux City, Iowa, and uh, Sharon is back with us. Tell us about the poster behind you there. That's uh, another one of your movies from back in the day. Oh, yeah, that's uh, The Fifth Floor, and um, I had a friend that worked at Playboy, and um, uh, on the fifth floor they had this poster of me, and uh, when he left Playboy, he, <laughs> he stole the poster and gave it to me. Nice, there we go. <laughs> so that's how I got it. <laughs> My goodness. But it's like, I'm like, you know, I'm like holding on, holding on to bars and, you know, trying to get out of a nut house. There you go. Um, <laughs> Another nut house. <laughs> late in the, uh, in the 70s and through the early 80s, I know you started doing some game shows that a lot of times can be seen on different uh, web, websites, uh, of course, with, with uh, technology. Uh, the one, of course, folks know you from is Match Game, of course, the old Gene Rayburn uh, show. Uh, you guys seem like you used to have a good time because I think, what, you were doing about three or uh, probably shooting a week's worth of shows in one in one take, correct? Yeah, one day we'd do like a bunch of shows. And I, I, I worked with Betty White and she was just a doll. And, she um, was just a lot of fun. Some I of the, was putting my clothes. I was putting my clothes on her. And she was wearing my clothes. And it, we just and we were just silly and crazy, and it was just fun. There's this one clip I've seen of you, McLean Stevenson. There was a gentleman up on the second tier with Charles Nelson Riley and Brett Summers. Uh, a whole thing where I don't know. You you wound up literally. I think uh, Gene nearly nearly jumped on you even then. I mean, it was it was quite a uh, quite a, a crazy show back in the day. It was very good. Sharon is yeah. giving us a tour as we're going along. So we're I'm, just, I'm we're, like, you know, the sun is coming in, and I'm just trying to like. No, no, you're good. You're good. I'm now, so sorry. I mentioned one to you off air, and actually, to your left, there's another painting there. Looks like a Wait. wolf. And she's got yeah, paintings see, yeah. all over. I guess Look at they it. can do this. Let's yeah, see. there you right. go. They're, they're nope. like my coyotes. Yes. Okay, but now yeah. now we're losing in the light. So you want to go back to, <laughs> you want to go okay. back to where you were. There you go. I mentioned to you off air as we were getting ready to do the show, and I think she doesn't remember because, again, I don't know what was going on in those days, but you were on a show called The Movie Game. Oh, I can't go there. Okay, I'm yep. sorry. I was on, yeah, The Movie. The Movie what? Game. Sonny Fox was the host, and the hmm. panelists, you were there for a week. Sharon has no recollection of this. The uh, panelists were Dick Martin and Dan Rowan from Laugh-In. And the lovely and legendary Greer Garson, who was there. I mean, that, that was amazing that she was there. And then Sharon, and at first, I didn't even recognize you. You had your hair in pigtails. Oh, God. I'm yeah. assuming you were doing a movie because uh, you were like a brunette on that, on that show. And uh, I said, wow. I said, that's, that's really Sharon Farrell. And you look like you were also very chummy with Dick Martin. Uh, were, was he another one of your uh, dates or no? No, I, they were just, I don't know, we were shooting all these shows and 
we were just all together all day long doing one show after another and we just all got a little crazy you know just we just got crazy from being on the show and we just started entertaining ourselves i the same thing happened with vincent price i mean he was just such a doll you know Sometimes you just click it off with certain people and they really like you or you just get along. Or I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to get the light right and I can't. Yeah, no, my you're fine. My house is just goofy. It's not cooperating with no, me No, you're all. fine right where you are. Uh, Vincent Price, by the way, would have been interesting had he been alive now because oh, uh, so he, he was a very much a, um, a connoisseur and an expert on paintings. And I'm sure he would have enjoyed seeing your work. So. There we go. I'm getting seasick from this, but <laughs> we're, we're following Sharon. There we go. I'm so sorry. No, Gosh. no, no problem. Okay, now, that's okay. I'd like. Now you're good. Kind of gone a little bit there away. There you it's go. Just over here a little bit. There you go. We're, we're back to we're back to the <laughs> bear and one of your one of your expert uh, paintings. Um, I'm worn out carrying my computer around. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now I've totally blanked on what I was going to ask. Oh, Henry Kissinger. There's a Henry Kissinger story uh, that do you recall that. Oh, I was invited. Rhonda Barrett, I think it was, had these big, huge parties at her house. And usually they would take, Jill St. John was always going out with him. And um, I I was seated next to him at this dinner party. And I was going for, I, I was going for, I, w I was going for, um, cheese because i thought that was cheese for my you know because you know how they serve you bread sure. and then you have uh, you have butter and bread and well i thought it was cheese because there was something so stinky <laughs> and uh, i was sitting right next to henry kissinger and rona barrett said sharon that's his feet it's not cheese that's butter <laughs> and i just about died i was so embarrassed but Rona Barrett was very funny. She was just, she was just very funny. But um, I don't know how Jill St. John could have, I don't know how she went out with them. That's, really that's why she went running to Robert Wagner later in life. Oh, there you go. Golly, there you go. Yeah. I mean, now, Robert Wagner, he was, he used to follow pretty girls down the street. He well, really did. He, but, you know, anybody who does is that, you know, if they don't do it, if they don't do a flip for me, I'm not going with them. You know? When, when he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or put when, their hands on the pips. <laughs> when, when he, when he wrote, uh, wow, when he wrote a book uh, several years ago, he, he admitted that he had had a uh, love affair with um, somebody. Was it Barbara Stanwyck or Joan Crawford? I think it was Barbara Stanwyck. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I kind of remember yeah. that. Yeah, when he was very young and everything. And then later I remember she got an award, like an honorary thing. This was like in the 80s before she passed. And Oh my goodness! She used to. She spoke of him like so glowingly. Now he's an adult man. Back then he was. He was like a young guy starting yeah, out in the she business. She was a cougar. <laughs> yeah. She was a cougar. Oh, she was. Yeah, probably a mod, uh, an early day version. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good point. Sharon Farrell joining us here for the hour on Studio Four One One. The book Sharon Farrell, Hollywood Princess, from Sioux City, Iowa. Um, let's see. You mentioned to uh, uh, something I read. Bob Hope. Bob Hope. Uh, Helped you out uh, in a couple of ways. What he helped you to film the TV pilot. Is that correct? Well, tell me about yeah, that. I was in New York City, and I was all of a sudden I was getting all kinds of offers. I was getting offers to do a um, a series there, a daytime series. I as the world turns, I think, and they wanted me for a Alberto Vo Five girl. They wanted me to do that, and they wanted me to understudy Barefoot in the Park with Bob Redford and um, Elizabeth Ashley. And I had understudied before, and Bob Hope wanted, I was wanted for um, Beverly Hillbillies, and Bob Hope wanted me to do this pilot called Amy, Once in Love with Amy. And Ray Bolger was singing the songs, and I went with that. I was, they told me to, like, do the Buddy Epson thing because wow. he was carrying the show, and he was, like, he was such a good actor. And, of course, Beverly Hillbillies was sold. But I don't think any of those people got any residuals anyway. You could have been, uh, had the role Donna Douglas was, uh, uh, took, Ellie Mae. Yeah. yeah, but she yeah. didn't ever get any residuals. Yeah. You oh. know, that's what we're looking, you know, we're looking back on who got residuals and who didn't. I mean, I was offered All in the Family the same time I was offered uh, The Reavers with Stephen Queen, and I took All in the Fam. I mean, I took The Reavers, and Carol, Carol Connors got so mad at me. I mean, every time he'd see me, he'd go like this. So you were you would have gotten the role that Sally Struthers got? 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Holy cow. I, 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 you know, I, I, are you kidding? Steve McQueen was the highest paid actor in the world at that time. Yeah. He was the most popular. It was a movie. It was the Reavers. I mean, every girl in Hollywood wanted to get up for that part. Uh, Mark Rydell was the director who was a fabulous director. Um, who else was in? Um, I mean, every Will Gear was in it. Uh, oh, it's a wonderful script by Harriet and Irving Ravage and uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by, you know, what's his name? I can't remember his yeah. name. The author of The Reavers. Yeah, it'll come to you. Not Mark Twain, but he's, he sure. was back there with Mark Twain. Yeah. Um, so it was like a, a real, and it's still just a beautiful movie. It's just a wonderful movie about, uh, it's a wonderful movie. Yeah. So I, there was no way I could turn it on. All in the Family wasn't even sold. It right, was and, and All in the Family, now we look back at it and now, we know, all right, now. All in the Family so wonderful. Yeah. Golly, it's like but, I would have. I would have loved to. I wish I could have done both. <laughs> sure, but I mean, it makes sense. The 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 percentages were with doing the movie because of who the star was, and and uh, all that went with that. Yeah, I mean, pilots yeah, I, come and go. You know, you were on a show called uh, Saints and Sinners. Was that with John MacGyver, or who was in that show? Uh, oh golly, uh, he what the guy was killed. Um, oh, what was his name? I can't remember his name. That was in the early oh, '60s. And that, I can see his face. That ran about Nick Adams. Nick Adams. Oh, Nick Adams. Nick Adams okay, was yeah. The star yeah, yeah. It was called Saints and Sinners, and I played a copy boy. And there were all kinds of actors, really, really famous actors, and they would guest star. They had the guest star role all the time. I was always, you know, I was like the copy girl. I was running, I was running around in the background mostly. I think. There you go. But um, that was one I did, and. Um, now tell me, being an actress, and again, uh, you know, if folks uh, could see as I did when I was doing the research, you know, the, um, you know, the, the list of credits, I mean, the 60s, 70s, 80s, television, especially some movies sprinkled in. I mean, you were working, uh, I don't know, it, it looked like, you know, 30 weeks a year, but yet I also realized that 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, the money wasn't what it is. Um, well, I mean, no, you're... You're wrong about that because yeah. the money today, I have a girlfriend who's like going to do this, this, you know, if you work in a movie with a really huge star, let's say Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone or Mel Gibson or something like that, those guys take all the money right. and you work for scale. Yeah. Gotcha. You work okay. for scale. And, and I have a girlfriend who is starring in a movie and I'm not going to say the guy's name. But there is no money for her wow. at all. She's working for scale, and she's taking it because it's a very big movie and it's a very good part. But I'll tell you, it's like um, you have to be a producer these days to like uh, come out ahead. So, and um, it, it's really, really difficult. It's like even with commercials, they'll like, it, I mean, I would do commercials. I did a Berto VO5, I did Spick and Span, I did Cesp. And I mean, every time it would be shown, I would have forty-five dollars in my pocket, and it would be shown like three or four or five, six times a night. And we just had ABC, NBC, CBS. Sure. I mean, those were the shows, you yeah. know. And but those shows, the commercials paid, and an actor could work. Now you do a, a commercial, and they buy you out for two hundred fifty dollars forever. Wow! And that's all you make. Unless you become, and unless you become like the. Uh, have to like they've got to like i mean the the actors that are here trying to act they're all richy rich kids yeah they're richy rich i mean i came to new york with nothing and i babysat dogs and walked them and and walked kids to school and waitressed and i did all those kinds of things while i was trying to go up for things and you could walk around you could pound the pavement you could walk from one interview to the next you could read variety and you could walk to the theaters and you could read you could read for these things sure. now it's different you've got to be richy rich they want you to pay forty dollars uh, a time to meet a casting director uh, it, it's it's all done electronically you have to have an agent and it's like you you, you watch television these days and it's one this, I mean, ner the woman who's on Nurse Jackie, she's on another show. I mean, I think she's on, you know, it's like you turn on any show, and those same actors are doing the same work. They just 
cast the same people over and over again because they're just too scared to go with anybody else. Yeah, yeah. So it's like really, it's a totally different business. But I worked up until 1999. I, I did Gift from Heaven, which I won an award in Rome, Italy for Best Actress. And I did. I was doing The Young and Restless, and I went up and I did a play, and they let me do that when I was on y &R. Sure. They They were just wonderful on y &R. They let me... They let me off to do thing, other things. It was a wonderful show to work on, and wonderful actors, and uh, Bill Bell and his wife and his children. I mean, they were all just, they were a class act. And um, I worked up until 1999. I was dragged off to Fiji to retire because I was told, well, you'll never really be a big star. You're, you know, you're, what are you doing? You're not, you're not doing anything, you know. And I was, like, stupid to believe this. Well, because, like you said, it's like in any profession. You get out of it, and then it's hard to get back in because yeah. the yeah. technology changes alone, uh, not to mention then. Uh, yeah. I'm sure agents move on or pass on, and now you're kind of like, wow. They pass on, or they become senile and yeah. send you the wrong yeah. places. And yeah, so then you well, got you got to work hard to uh, to kind of get the ball rolling again. And uh, the yeah, last thing you I were on, there's there are two young actresses that are helping me. Uh, uh, um, Brenda and Dawn, these two gals, and Brenda's. Oh, you got to have Brenda on the show. She's she's written a book. I, she's sending it to me. I haven't gotten it yet. Sure. I think it's called Driving, Driving in Town, or I, I can't remember the name of it. But she's she she played Lana Turner in um, Confidential, mm -hmm. L.A. Confidential. Yeah, yeah. She's a fabulous actress, and um, Sharon DeBoard thinks of her as like a daughter. And I talked to her on the phone one time, and it's like she's really helping me, and that's just so nice, you know, um, that somebody would help me find an agent because that's what I've got to do if I. If I can't just retire and no nah, retirement's uh, not not all it's cracked up to be. You have too much zest and vibrance, so you need to uh, you need to keep uh, keep on plugging away. Uh, Sharon Farrell joining us here on our remaining moments on Studio Four One One. The book Sharon Farrell, Hollywood Princess from Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, www. There's the book right there. Uh, SharonFarrell.com for more information. Uh, in the remaining moments, uh, we, we see a lot of celebrities, I think, with social media and everything going on with uh, substance abuse issues. Do you think that it's elevated now more because of the social media presence, or do you think that back in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s that it was just as prevalent? Oh, I think it's just the same. Yeah. I really do. I think it's absolutely the same. You know, everybody wants to try things. I, I think it was it was worse back then because I mean we were chopping up cocaine on on the camera on the camera stands. Um, you know when I was working with Peter O'Toole, I mean everybody in the whole cast and everybody it was like more flamboyant. You know we were tossing coke bottles back and forth. You know, it was it was more accepted. Um, but I don't know. It's like I was driving on PCH and I saw a girl in a, a Mustang, a convertible Mustang, and they were smoking a joint. They were going back and forth. I pulled over and waited till they got way up ahead of me because the grass and the marijuana these days is so much stronger than what we did. Sure. I mean, I mean, you can take a hit off a a joint these days and you cannot get off your couch you're just stuck there because it's so strong so I don't know what's it's it's I don't think people should be able to drive doing it I'll tell you I, yeah. I you know it's it, I, it's probably worse now it's probably I, I was gonna, worse now I usually don't ask this of too many guests but she just answered what do you think about legalizing marijuana in America well Sharon gave me the answer without even asking the question so that's good um, what has uh, helped you get through? You know something, they use it for the hemp, you know, the hemp plant, but that, is, that doesn't get anybody high, but that has been used since, you know, they, I mean, and sailboats with those, you know, with the people fighting swords and stuff. Back in the, care, you know, back, I mean, they've been making ropes out of that ever, ropes and sails for, you know, ships and things. I mean, hemp has been around forever, and they've used it just forever. I think medicinally they should be able to use it. I think if they do legalize it, I think it should go for schools, or it should really go to do something, and it should really go, because they've got a lottery here, 
And they say in California, it, it, the lottery was brought in, and, and it's like our schools here haven't gotten any better, really. I mean, they really haven't. So that was a big scam, you know, with the lottery. But they used the lottery way back in George Washington's day. Right. You know, so uh, I just wish that, well, we've got more transparency, so people are going to be forced to be more honest because we flush them out. There you go. You know? Um Let's see now. Uh, uh, she she lost me with that that left turn there. <laughs> oh my goodness, Santaya! See, you should. Did you ever think about running for politics? That question. Did you ever think? I didn't ask the question. You actually no, answered I'm, it, and I'm looking I'm at the. I'm not, I, I should have kept my big mouth shut. Sorry. Have you ever thought about running for politics? Because you you uh, oh. unlike uh, today's politicians, you hold nothing back. I could never, I could, I'm not, I'm a follower. I am not a leader. I am a follower. There you go. I really am. I have to, you know, it's like, it's like if you put a piece of paper in front of me, I just sign it. You know, I don't, I don't read it or anything because when somebody's holding down the piece of paper and you can't turn it over to see what you're <laughs> signing and they, you know, when they've got the check in front of you and they just hold it down and, and they say sign it and it's like you hesitate and you get a whacked on the head and you, you sign it, you know. So I don't know. I've always been, I've always been a doormat, you know. I'm used to that position. I need a man that's going to tell me what to do or an agent to tell me what to do. I'm, I'm, well, I don't know. I'm good for nothing. You no, know, <laughs> no, you're, you're doing, you're doing quite well. I, I admire your, uh, your persistence and your, uh, uh, you know, feistiness for lack of a better word. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Give me some like real, real quick thoughts, like, you know, about 10 seconds on each of these people. Uh, David Jansen, you worked with him on a Harry O and the Fugitive. Ten oh, seconds. He was so funny. We went to we went to a restaurant called La Fugue with Little Formos, and he said to me, "Do you wanna?" With that f word, yeah. and I just I just started laughing. He says, "Oh, great! Let's have a drink." There you go. And it was like he I loved him. He was great. He was he made you feel good, but he didn't he didn't he didn't right tuck your yeah. paw or anything, you know. Ben Casey. Like, Ben Casey's Vince Edwards, for those of you from the, remember the 60s, uh, you dated well, I, Vince, correct? I, I used to go out with him. I learned how to, to uh, handicap horses. I learned to love horses through Vince, but it was like, I mean, and he was winning when I went out with him. He was throwing money out the cars when we went down to Tijuana and he'd win the 510. Um, he was like a boyfriend of mine, but I, he was really because my mom liked him. Now this one, be very careful. Ten seconds. Richard Chamberlain, who you worked with on Doctor Kildare, nice man oh, to work you with. Know, he was he was quite a rooster in his day. He was going out with Jane Fonda, and he was asking me out. And he's 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 still around. Yes, he's still yeah. pretty good. Yeah. He's a rooster. Let me tell you. <laughs> he's still uh, a rooster. Well. You told it. I think someone's trying to get a message to me, but I didn't hear that. Uh, Robert <laughs> Robert Vaughn on Man from Uncle. You worked with him several times. Uh, he's he he's very professional, and he's the one that should have gone into politics because that's what he wanted to do. He was when I went out with him. He said, "Would you like to live?" You know, and um, and he gave me the address of the White House. You know, and I at the time I didn't even I still can't remember the address of the White House, but uh, he he was quite he was. He was, he was quite a guy. He yeah. really was. He's still alive. He lives here him. in Connecticut, or was, yeah. He lives yeah, here in Connecticut. He's, still, he's he, uh, you know, I don't know why. I wonder if he's still working. He should. Uh, he does commercials for like the uh, like those uh, lawyer commercials. Oh, does he? Yeah, yeah. But I haven't that's seen him. I actually saw him. He was at some event, uh, one of those autograph shows. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask. A couple of things, real quick, as we're winding down. Uh, the crew in there, there's a photo of Sharon and Dolly Parton just taken recently. Was that really Dolly Parton? Yes. I, uh, you know, it was, I got, I, I, I was eating, I was, I was, what was I eating? I got something stuck in my tube. And I'm sitting there with this gentleman for lunch yeah. that I found on Match.com. And he was like 80 years old, okay? And he was all nice and everything. But I, but I, I got something stuck in my tooth and I had to excuse myself and I went into the ladies' room. 
And I'm si- I had my purse all dumped out, and I'm digging around for dental floss. You know those little things yeah. that you get with a, you know, you got a little handle on it, it's plastic, and you can get things out of your teeth. Nothing. I couldn't find anything in my purse that I, I have like everything in this great big huge black hole purse. And this woman comes in. And she says, honey, I wish I could imitate her. Honey, what are you doing? What do you got all your stuff on? on all, why, why do you have all your stuff spread out all over the sink here, honey? And it was Dolly Parton. Now, did she and know who you were or she didn't know you? Did no, she know you we, were Sharon I, Farrell, the actress? Didn't know me. We didn't, we didn't, we just were like women. You know, we didn't, I wasn't really looking at her and she wasn't really looking at me. She was looking at all the stuff, the big mess I'd made on the, on the sink. Right. And, um. She said, oh, you're Sharon Farrell. And oh, I said, oh, you're Dolly Parton. And she says, yes, I am. <laughs> I am Dolly Parton. And uh, she was, I'll tell you that, what, she is much prettier in person than she is in a photograph yeah. or on film. No, she is gorgeous. Her skin is just porcelain. We're showing and that, that photo is, right now. Is, yeah. That photo does not do her justice at all. That woman is gorgeous. And she's, she's got this cute little figure with not one ounce of fat on her yeah no no she, she's so hot yeah and i don't know she was like i don't know what she was doing because we didn't talk about that all we did was talk about our teeth and she was saying do you have porcelain teeth i got porcelain teeth she says this is what i do she says do you want to use my toothbrush and what she and then she took her toothbrush she said, i just go like this and she was like she, she was like you know toothbrush go like that and I thought, I don't know, the first thing I thought was germs. You know, there you I go. wasn't going to use her toothbrush, you know. I mean, I loved her to death. She, she treated me like a sister, you know. But I, I wouldn't use my sister's toothbrush, sure, you know. Sure. I mean, unless we had, like, some alcohol or something around. There you go. Well, on that dental note, we've come to the end of uh, another episode here of Studio 411. Sharon, thank you so much. We'll have you back on again. Uh, the book, Sharon Farrell, Hollywood Princess from Sioux City, Iowa. For more information, uh, SharonFarrell.com. Uh, and uh, you, are, you are a pistol, let me tell you. A pistol, a pistol, he said, a pistol. So thanks for joining us, and hang on right there. There's the book. And uh, we thank you for joining us here on this episode of Studio 411. Uh, I hope you had as much fun as we did today, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you guys again very soon. Take care.